And that was from Billy Bragg. Okay, so we are into the final part of the final V nut B of what has been a pretty dreadful year, if we're honest, hasn't it? 2020. But we've still got some more Christmas cheer coming your way. Okay, um, drum roll, please. Our next reader is Catherine Cooper. Now, Catherine has asked me to um, apologise in advance, I think, because she is going to be reading from her book, The Chalet, from an actual chalet. And she's worried she's look, going to look a bit flash by doing so. I'll let her explain. Um, Catherine Cooper is a freelance journalist and keen skier. She now lives in the south of France. Mm. The Chalet is her debut novel. So huge round of applause everyone for Catherine Cooper. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in a chalet as you might be able to see um, in the French Alps. I'm, um, I'm here to review it for the Telegraph. Um, so it honestly wasn't deliberate. So I just wanted to apologize in advance for it. Um, looking a little bit showy. It's really, really very smart. Um, anyway, this is my debut novel, as you say. Um, so, um, what can I tell you about it? It's, um, it's set across two main timelines, 1998 and um, 2020. Um, in 1998, um, two men go out skiing with some guides and only one comes back. Um, and in 2020, um, there's a group of people staying in a very smart chalet. Um, and so the book is really works for the reader to work out what um, the current people, the 2020 people, have to do with the 1998 people. Um, so I thought I would read um, a little bit just in from the beginning. This is um, set in the, um, this is like the present people. Um, Hugo wants, um, Hugo is a, he owns a travel company and he wants Simon to invest in his business. So Simon and Cass are guests of um, Hugo and his wife Ria in this um, very nice chalet. Um, so that's what it is. Um, so um, January 2020, La Madière, France, Ria. There is a gentle knocking at the door and Millie comes in with our morning tea. I keep my eyes tightly shut. My head hurts and my mouth is dry. I don't want to have to deal with Hugo's disapproving looks and I don't want a lecture about how I need to behave better if he wants to get Simon on board. I simply don't care. I shouldn't have come here. Maybe I shouldn't even have married Hugo. I hear the door close softly and Hugo prods me in the back. Thankfully this morning it's with his hand. Ria, you awake? I mumble something incoherent, which I hope makes me sound like I'm still asleep. Hugo sighs, gets out of bed and goes into the shower. I carry on pretending to sleep while he gets dressed and he doesn't try to wake me. I guess he's still annoyed about how I behaved last night. Once he's left the room, I manage to fall back to sleep for real. What feels like seconds later, Hugo slams open the door and says far too loudly, Ria, wake up now. I open my eyes and look at him grumpily. What? Why can't you let me sleep? Do I have to go skiing each and every day with bloody Cass? I thought this was supposed to be a holiday, for me at least, not just some giant schmooze fest. Why can't I stay in bed if I want to? God, Rhea, it's all about you, isn't it, Hugo says, unchar uncharacteristically snappy. I don't care if you're too hungover to ski. Serves you right after your appalling display last night. Anyway, you need to get up. Cass has gone missing and we need to help look for her. I sit up and rub my eyes. What? Why do we have to look for her? She's a grown woman. She probably, she's probably gone for a walk or something. Hugo sighs. You may well be right, but Simon is beside himself. Seems she's been suffering with postnatal depression and he's worried she might hurt herself or something. He says she wouldn't go anywhere without the baby and without telling anyone. I sigh and sink back onto the pillows. Yes, she would. The baby's always with a nanny. Cass barely seems to spend any time with it at all. Hugo strides over to the bed and hauls the covers back. I turn over onto my front, feeling strangely exposed. It doesn't matter what you or I think, he says in a low voice. I'm sure she's fine too but I want us to look like we're being helpful, like we care, which I do, even if you don't. So get yourself out of bed and get dressed, okay? Once I've had a quick shower, some paracetamol and two Barocca to try and wake myself up, I go downstairs to the living room. Simon is sitting on the leather sofa, holding the baby and staring into space. Matt is on the phone speaking French and gesticulating, and Millie is standing anxiously and awkwardly by the sofa, patting Simon's shoulder. Simon, Hugo says, what can we do to help? 
Should we go and walk around the resort, see if we can see her? I look out the window and see that it's snowing really quite hard. Please say no, I plead inwardly. Simon ignores Hugo's question, gets up from the sofa and distractedly hands Hugo the baby. Hugo makes a coochie-coo noise at Inigo and Inigo giggles. Who's a gorgeous boy, Hugo says in that stupid high-pitched voice everyone seems to use to talk to babies. Simon gives Hugo a despairing look, runs his hand through his thinning hair and paces up and down by the enormous glass wall. Hugo turns his attention back to Simon, pulling a sympathetic face while gently rocking the baby. It's all my fault, Simon says, his voice strained and strangulated. I shouldn't have stayed up last night. I shouldn't have got drunk. I should have been in bed with Cass, looking after my wife and my baby. It's all my fault. She's so vulnerable at the moment. I shouldn't have brought her here. Anything's happened to her. Millie pats his shoulder again. I'm sure she's fine, Simon, I say, in what I think is my best sympathetic voice. Hugo will be impressed. He's probably gone out to clear her head or something. Matt gets off the phone. Well, I've called the gendarme and they say they'll keep an eye out for her, but it's too early to do the thing yet. She's an adult and she's only been missing a maximum of a few hours. I've also called the tourist office and the mairie, but there's not. The hospital, Simon almost shouts, stopping his pacing. Shouldn't we call the hospitals? Matt and Millie exchange a look. Sarah, who's just come in with Inigo's blanket, subtly rolls her eyes at me and I hold in a smirk. She reaches her arms out towards Hugo to take the baby and Hugo kisses Inigo's head before he hands him over. Ugh. Shall we wait a little and see if Cass turns up first, Matt says tentatively. After all, we've no real evidence anything's wrong yet. Simon slumps down into the sofa and sinks his head back into his hands. I'd like it if you'd call the local hospitals, please, he says quietly, without looking up. I would do it, but I don't speak any French. Of course, Matt says, in a professional tone of voice, no doubt trying to hide his irritation. I'll do it now. I'll go and have a walk around the resort, Hugo says. She's got to be somewhere. He looks at me meaningfully. I say nothing. But then I glance at Simon again, and he seems so pitiful, I can't help but say, I'll go too, as soon as I've changed into something warmer. Hugo and I agree that we will cover the ground more quickly if we split up. The chalet is peace side on the very edge of the village. So once we've walked down the tree-lined driveway to the main road at the top of the village, he sets off to the left while I say I will walk around to the right. If I was Cass, who has no doubt slipped out for some quiet time by herself, I'd be really annoyed to be found. So I put my head round the door in most of the cafes and shops I pass for the first hundred metres or so, and then stop for a cafe au lait in one which has a particularly nice open fire. About an hour later, I wander back to the chalet. Nothing much seems to have changed except that Matt has gone and Simon has moved over to the huge glass wall where he's staring miserably out over the valley. Hugo isn't there and I wonder briefly if I should have stayed out longer pretending to look for Cass. No news, I ask. Millie smiles sympathetically and shakes her head. Not yet, she says. I don't understand where she could have gone, Simon says hoarsely, banging his fist against the glass. If anything's happened to her, I'll never forgive myself. Um, and that's that's my section. Um, I'm going to mention, like Nell, that um, the chalet is also 99p on Kindle at the moment, and um, the paperbacks are in Tesco's and um, Asda and Waterstones. Thank you so much for that. Um, and as I was explaining at the beginning of um, this evening, sometimes I say things that sound really sarcastic, and they're not. I'm just insanely jealous that you're in a chalet right now and I am here not in a chalet and um, that was brilliant thank you so much for joining us this evening um okay so thank you thank you very much an evening of bargains indeed Olga Voitas thank you for being with us despite having to sneak in past the bouncer we all know what you did <laughs> continuing on a chilling theme is Ali Reynolds, all the way, I might add, from Australia. Years ago, Ali Reynolds was a freestyle snowboarder in the UK top 10. Woo she moved to Australia's Gold Coast in 2004, where she taught English for many years. And again, I'm not at all jealous that she's in Australia and I am not. So everybody, huge round of applause for Ali, Ali Reynolds. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I am going to read from the opening of Shiva because it's not out until the 21st of January in the UK. So I'm going to read the prologue, which is really, really short, and a tiny bit of chapter one. Okay. It's that time of year again, the time the glacier gives up bodies. 
The immense mass of ice up there is a frozen river that flows too slowly for the eye to see. Recent victims brush shoulders with older ones in its glassy depths. Some emerge at the top, others at the snout, and there's no way of knowing who will come out next. It can take years for them to reappear, decades even. A glacier in neighbouring Italy made the news recently when it produced the mummified corpses of First World War soldiers, complete with helmets and rifles. Still, what goes in must eventually come out, so I've been checking the local news every morning. There's one particular body that I'm waiting for. Chapter one. Hello? My shout echoes around the concrete cabin. The familiar red and white cable car sits in the bay, but there's nobody in the operator booth. The sun has disappeared behind the Alps. The sky is pink. Yet there isn't a single light on in the building. Where is everyone? An icy wind blasts my cheeks. I huddle deeper into my jacket. It's the off season and the resort doesn't open for another month. So I didn't expect the other ski lifts to be running, but I thought this one would be. How else are we going to get up to the glacier? Have I got the wrong day? I dump my snowball bag on the platform and pull out my phone to check the email again. I know it's been a while, but are you up for a reunion weekend, panorama building, Glacier de Diablo, Le Rocher, meet at the cable car, 5 p.m., Friday 7th of November. C. C for Curtis. If anyone else had invited me here, I would have deleted it without replying. Yo, Miller. And here's Brent loping up the steps towards me. Two years younger than me, he must be 31 now, and he still has his boyish charm, the floppy dark hair, the dimples, although he looks worn and tired. He lifts me off the ground in a bear hug. I hug him tightly back. All those cold nights I spent in his bed. I feel bad for not getting in contact with him, but after what happened, anyway, he didn't contact me either. Over his shoulder, sharp peaks loom in shadow against the darkening sky. Do I really want to do this? It's not too late. I could make excuses, jump back in my car and drive home to Sheffield. A throat clears behind us. We pull apart to see Curtis's tall blonde form. Somehow I expected Curtis to look the same as the last time I saw him. Collapsed with grief, a broken man. But of course he doesn't. He's had 10 years to get over it or tuck it all away inside him. Curtis's hug is brief. Good to see you, Bill. Good to see you, Miller. You too. I always struggled to look him in the eye because it was so damn good looking, still is, but I find it even harder now. Curtis and Brent grip hands, Curtis's skin pale against Brent's. They brought their snowboards, no surprises there. We could hardly go up there without them. Like me, they wear jeans, but I'm amused to see shirt collars underneath their snowboard jackets. Hope I wasn't expected to dress up, I say. Curtis looks me up and down. You'll do. I swallow. His eyes are as blue as ever, but they remind me of someone I don't want to think of. There's none of the warmth I used to feel from him either. For him, I drag myself back to the place I swore I'd never return to. I'm already regretting it. Who else is coming? Brent says. Why is he looking at me? No idea, I say. Curtis laughs. Don't you know? Footsteps. Here comes Heather. And who's that? Dale? No way. Are they still together? Dale's previously wild hair is stylishly cut, his piercings removed. His trendy skate shoes don't even look skated in. I guess he's been heathered. At least she let him bring his snowboard. Heather's wearing a dress, a sparkly black one with tights and knee-high boots. Must be bloody freezing, even with a puffer jacket over it. A whiff of hairspray from her long dark locks as she hugs me. Great to see you, Miller. She must have had a few drinks before she got here because she almost sounds like she means it. Her boots have a three inch heel, bringing her to an inch taller than me, which is probably why she's wearing them. She flashes a ring. You guys got married, I say, congratulations. Three years now. Her Geordie accent is thicker than ever. Brent and Curtis slap Dale's back. Took your time asking her, bro, Brent says. His London accent seems stronger too. Actually, I asked him, Heather snaps. The door of the cable car grinds open. A lift attendant shuffles up behind us, black resort cap pulled low. 
He checks off our names on a clipboard and gestures for us to enter. The others file past. Is that everyone, I say, playing for time? The lifty seems to think so. There's something familiar about him. Everyone else is aboard now. Reluctantly, I join them. Who else would there be anyway, Curtis says. True, I say. There were a few others who came and went, but of our original gang, we're the only five left. Or rather, the only five still standing. A flood of guilt hits me. She will never walk again. The lifty shuts the door. I strain to see his face, but before I can get a better look, he heads off along the platform and disappears to his booth. The cable car lurches into motion. Like me, the others stare through the plexiglass spellbound as we fly over the tops of fir trees, chasing the fading light up the mountain. It's weird to see dirt and grass below. It was always snow. I look for marmots, but they're probably hibernating. We pass over a cliff and the tiny village of Le Rocher disappears from view. Suspended in the air like this with the scenery slipping past the window, I get the strangest feeling. Instead of traveling up the mountain, it's like we're traveling back in time. And I don't know if I'm ready to face the past. Too late, the cable car is swinging into the mid station already. We step out dragging our bags. It's colder here and it'll be colder still where we're going. A French flag flaps in the breeze. The plateau is deserted. Halfway up, the browns and greens turn to white, the snow line. I thought the snow would be right down to the valley by now, Brent says. Curtis nods, that's climate change for you. This is the heart of the ski area in winter, with chairlifts and toes going off in all directions, but the bubble lift is the only one running today. The half pipe used to be right there next to that little shack. The long U-shaped channel is just a muddy ditch right now, but in my mind's eye, I can see the pristine white walls. Best half pipe in Europe at the time, and it's what brought us all here that winter. God, the memories. I've got goosebumps. I can picture our younger selves jostling and laughing. The five of us, plus the two who are missing. A freezing gust swells my hair around my face. I zip my snowboard jacket up to my chin and hurry after the others. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so early in the morning for you as well, Ali. Um, that was brilliant. Um, and you have been nominated for Court of the Week. Folks, if you have got a nomination for Court of the Week that has not yet appeared in the chat, please do put it in there. Um, we are down to our penultimate reader of the evening. And it is... Andrew Cotto. So we've come from Australia. We are now going across to America. <laughs> yeah. Andrew Cotto is an award-winning author and regular contributor to the New York Times. He has also written for Rolling Stone, Men's Journal, Parade. I'm going to get this wrong on La Cucina Italiana, Condé Nast Traveller, The Huffington Post, Salon, Maxim and more. Woo! -hoo! Andrew lives in Brooklyn, New York. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Andrew Cotto. Hi Vic, how are you? Good. Um, thank you for having me on this. I'm, am I doing something wrong? Um, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Um, a couple of disclaimers. One, I'm, I'm not home. I'm at my, the house of my father's girlfriend, which is a lovely place with this beautiful office, but there's a giant grandfather clock behind me that goes off every 15 minutes. Um, so if it does happen to go off when I'm reading, I will just pause and let it finish. Um, the second is that I have this really weird habit of picking up other people's accents. So if I start reading like I'm from Newcastle, it, please just overlook it and, and forgive me in advance. No, I'd, like, I'd love to have that accent. It's lovely. Um, what I'm reading from tonight is um, the sequel to one of my novels. Um, the storyline follows a character named Caesar Stiles, um, who runs away from his hometown in northern New Jersey at the age of 15 and drifts around America. He ends up uh, 10 years later in Brooklyn, where he becomes a, um, an accidental detective. And that, that mystery is uh, depicted in, in the first um, story in the series called Out of Borough Blues, A Brooklyn Mystery. Um, and at that, that novel ends with him leaving Brooklyn and walking um, towards New Jersey, and to cross the bridge into New Jersey, um, where the sequel takes place. It's called Black Irish Blues, that's it behind me. 
right? Dick has a copy on the shelf behind her too. Um, and I'm gonna read you the prologue. How did Gaitha do that thing where she was looking right at the camera when she read too, by the way? I wanna, you gotta share that trick with me later. Um, this is the prologue. The trouble with Dinny to it began with the two martini rule. It was an axiom of sorts about drinking and limits shared often by my mother that I thought to share with Dinny to it, who was sitting on two martinis thinking about a third. He'd come into my bar room on an autumn afternoon. The plantation shades were slanted over the wide windows that faced the west, and the fuzzy sunshine slatted the planks to fill the dark room with diffuse light. Dinny ordered a straight up, bone dry, stoly martini, no olives. He had a way of speaking I couldn't make, slick but mannered, unusual, like his name. He kept his money on the bar in a chrome clip and wore a sharp suit, tailored to his life frame. He was young, about my age, late twenties but all grown up, troubled actor handsome, a dimple in his chin and an active Adam's apple, a head of flowing black hair and green eyes. They called his type Black Irish back when I was a kid, back when there were a lot more Irish descendants in this town. And though I hadn't been around in a dozen years or so, I knew he wasn't from around here at all. Not from the first generation Irish or Italians who raised their kids in the trappings of 1970s lower middle class suburbia. Catholic schools and police athletic leagues and CYO, and two weeks every summer at the Jersey Shore or someplace upstate, at least for some. It wasn't like that for me and mine at all. Our family was a disaster. I was the youngest son of no good Timothy Stiles and his tragic Italian wife, refugees both from the Bronx and victims of a cursed ancestry. They had three boys, two dead now, with me responsible in some way for the respective deaths of both brothers. And I'd run away from this town at the age of 15 because of the first and good brother dying. And I was back and free all these years later because of the very recent death of the other one which didn't bother me at all. I'd spent the years away rambling around America, hopping trains and hitching rides, cooking or tending bar or building houses, never in one place for too long, except the years just spent in Brooklyn, close enough to home in Northern New Jersey, but not too close until it was safe to move back into the abandoned house I'd grown up in and buy my hometown's only inn to refurbish and redeem and make my own. And hopefully, and my family's curse. I bought the place in the spring and shut it down as the heat arrived, spending the summer sweating through my clothes in the undertaking of a massive gutting and rehab that turned a forever dingy watering hole with crap food and the ancient stench of broken trunks, including my own father, into a respectable establishment with plenty of light, a welcoming atmosphere, and damn good things to eat. We reopened a few weeks after Labor Day, and I dedicated most of my time to operations in the kitchen. I left the bar to the old schooler who'd worked there since nearly before I was born, 28 years earlier. Richie, the bartender, after his first summer off since quitting high school at age 16, had enjoyed his long days reading Raymond Chandler novels and lounging around his cottage by Greenwood Lake, just across the border into New York State. He talked about not coming back to work at all, after feeling his body recover from 40 years standing behind a bar, first in his native Bronx and then here. Richie agreed to stay on for shortened hours, a no smoking rule anywhere within the premises, two nights a week off, and whatever he wanted from my new menu, whether he was working or not. The afternoon that I met Diddy to it, Richie was on the schedule to 10, and he sat at the bar, at the end of the bar, in the natural light immersed in savory aroma, mopping up the sauce of the chicken dish he'd ordered for the second evening in a row. Brine thighs, broiled and covered in a sauce bright with lemon, olive oil, garlic, and oregano. Richie was the only one in the joint, besides me and Diddy to it, who was sitting on two martinis, thinking about a third. You know what they say about, you know what my mother used to say about martinis, I asked him? He set his green eyes on me, and they pulsed for a beat. 
or he decided to engage the tall stranger behind the bar in a white t-shirt with, with lank brown hair pulled to a tight ponytail and a large German knife paused for icy fruit. We locked eyes until a small smile creased his face and he spoke in a bemused tone. No, no, tell me, what'd your mother used to say about martinis? I put the knife down, wiped my hands and leaned into the bar toward the man who needed to know the two martini rules. They're like boobs, I said. One's not enough, but three are too many. His face went to work registering the comment. Squints and smirks and tilts to both sides as he tried to figure out if he'd been insulted or enlightened. It was like waiting for a slot machine to reveal its outcome. And I could tell this guy had a lot of potential outcomes, coiled and complex beneath the preternatural ease. He sniffed and straightened on his stool, and I sensed an insult for him, possibly one that involved my mother, and that would be bad. Richie cleared his throat and made some music with his silverware and plate. Dinny to it looked down at him and nodded before setting his eyes back on me, just as I spun the big knife handle three times around my palm and buried the blade into a wooden cutting board. The 545 commuter train rolled into the station with a loud blast of its horn. You know how to use a knife? He asked once the silence returned. I do. Cut some people? I have. He nodded and breathed through his nose, looked down at Richie, then back at me. And where are you from? I asked him. South Philly, he answered. I removed the blade from the cutting board, checked for damage to the tip. Guinea to it cleared his throat. You're the guy they've been talking about, he said. The runaway who came back and fixed this place up. I am. He did a nice job. Thanks. Why? He asked me. Why what? Why would you want to come back here? He asked. This town sucks. You know that, right? You don't say, I said. He polished off his drink and put the glass in front of me. I put it to the side. Dinny to it sucked his teeth and stood to leave. Your mother, he said, with the rule about the martinis. She's dead, right? Yeah. I said, feeling the sear of clever cruelty and the ache of sorrow. Thought so, he said. Dinny to it pulled a Marlboro light from the inside of his suit jacket, banged the filter thrice on the bar, and tucked it between two long fingers. I waited for a match to appear, for having to inform him that smoke was no longer permitted on the premises. Though I gathered he knew that already by the way he checked with Richie or eyeballing me until his face softened and the intensity in his eyes receded. He slipped the smoke behind his ear, pulled a crisp 20 from his clip, and dropped it down on a $12 tab. Sorry about your mother, he said, straight up. I watched him glide out the door. Richie took his plate to the kitchen and came behind the bar, tying his signature red apron around the rounded midriff of his white dress shirt over black slacks. The downy white hair still left on his head slicked back above his ears. And what's his story, I asked. Good question, Richie said with a huff, the hard scrabble of a Bronx still present in his throat. Name's Dinny Tuit, married to one of the Donaghy girls. I remember the Donaghy girls, four blondes, each two years apart, with smiling eyes and easy laughs, the kind of girls that owned every room they were in, the kind of girls made for cheerleader outfits and wedding dresses, stars of high school yearbooks. The kind of girls that made all kinds of boys do stupid, stupid shit. Which one he marry, I asked. The one with shit taste in men, Richard said. He come in a lot? On occasion, always about this time. Catches a decent buzz and splits it for the regular show. Is he trouble, I asked. Not really. It's just that he don't, you know, fit in. That's all. Black Irish, I said. Don't see them very much anymore. More black than Irish, Richie said with another huff. What's that mean? I asked him. You'll see, he said and started racking glasses. I looked at the spot where Dinny Tewitt had sat and tried to make sense of what Richie just said. All I knew was that I didn't like it, not the casual racism nor the caustic implication. But Richie was right about one thing. I'd be finding out about Dinny Tewitt, though I'd never see him in my bar again. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Um, I've got to say to you, 
your martini quart. I looked up at the panel and everybody else was just laughing the same way I was. So thank you for that. And we've also had some people um, mentioning Total Recall. To be honest, I will put a two vote on Twitter, but I can confidently say you've won. <laughs> you've had a lot of love for that quote. Um, and Derek Farrell has just compared you to Lawrence Block. So um, Merry Christmas. Um, okay, so Simon's sending me messages and I don't know what he's, what they mean. Sorry, Simon. Um, okay, final. Can you guess who it is? It is the one, the only, D.L. Marshall. The artist formerly known as Danny Young one time on Virtual Noir at the Bar when I got his name wrong. Anyway, Danny told me about these cocktails you can get in cans in the supermarket and I've been enjoying them this evening. So. This is all Danny's fault. Um, Danny Marshall is a thriller writer from West Yorkshire. He pitched at Bloody Scotland in 2016 and won a Northern Writers Award in 2018. In 2020, he reached the pinnacle of his writing career when his short story was included in Noir from the Bow. Danny's debut novel, Anthrax Island, will be published in spring 2021 and is available now for pre-order. So everybody, our final reader of 2020 is D.L. Marshall. Thank you. Am I off mute and okay? Brill. Um, I don't know how to follow three boobs. And yeah, but Total Recall does beg to differ. Um, my debut has just gone up on pre-order for Digil. As Vic said, the paperback should be available for pre-order in the new year. Um, the book's out in March. Eagle-eyed people might think that since the paperback doesn't exist, that this is a Greg Hurwitz novel with a print out wrapped around it. But I would definitely not do that. Um, it's a, a, a locked room thriller set on real life Grignard Island off Scotland, um, which was dubbed Anthrax Island, as it was used for biological weapons testing in the Second World War and left lethally contaminated with anthrax. And the premise of the book is that scientists have returned to research decontamination techniques when their base suffers a malfunction and their technician is a victim of anthrax. And our hero, Tyler, is a technician flown in to fix the base. He discovers sabotage and that his predecessor was murdered uh, with a, a further scientist being murdered inside a sealed room with Tyler right outside and the va killer vanishing into thin air. It becomes apparent there are worse things than anthrax on the island. So I did intend to read a section from Anthrax Island. That would be the logical thing to do since it's, it's out in a few months. But since it's a Christmas special, I'm going to read from the sequel to Anthrax Island, which is set at Christmas. I'm going to read uh, a passage where Tyler goes shopping for a new car. And I should set the scene by telling you we're in the French Alps. <clears throat> Here we go. I looked over at the woman in the passenger seat. You ready? She took a breath, swept her hair from her face and nodded. I turned the ignition off. As soon as the wipers stopped, the windscreen was thick with snow. I opened the door and climbed out. Aye, stay there, came a shout from the darkness. English, for my benefit. Christmas Wonderland had been even when we'd driven up earlier. The huge tree at the back of the car park dripping with twinkling strings of lights, but now it was a menacing black mass. I held my hands up, squinting at the cars parked in its shadow. Lights blazed on, the car park was deserted, but for us, I held a hand over my eyes, trying to look beyond the lights. A Mercedes saloon, three men, a fourth standing next to a Porsche hybrid SUV, pulled in close to the pines at the edge. One of the men broke away from the others, crunching through the snow. You're Mr. Kaplan? He asked, his breath swirling through the flakes in the headlights. I nodded, not the most original of names, but I'm a sucker for classics. You're late, he said with a frown. I'm already angry. Low life gobshite in a leather jacket and tracky pants. The right pocket clearly weighed down with something heavy. The guy wasn't a poker player. The car is ready, he continued, stopping just short of my bonnet, making a grabbing motion with a fat hand. Show me the money. I opened the back door and picked a shopping bag off the back seat, holding it up. You put the plates on. They're cloned from the same car in Nice. There'll be no problems. His fat hand was still beckoning at the air after the money. I tossed the bag on the back seat. We'll test drive it first. He frowned, cocking his head on one side. You want to test drive? There's a dealership in Geneva. The car's no good to me if an immobiliser kicks in as soon as we leave the department. 
I tell you, he disabled the tracker and the immobiliser as discussed. He rubbed his head and glanced behind him at the group of men shuffling nervously. You do not trust me? I trust a gang of car thieves as much as you trust a couple who need a stolen car. I gestured at the woman in the passenger seat. She opened the door and climbed out, leaning on the roof. I will take the Porsche for 10 minutes, she said in a clipped German accent at English. He will stay with some money. This is not what we agreed. Gobshite glanced behind him again. This is not, this is what is happening, she said with a sigh. If you have a problem with it, we're leaving. He held his hands out, walking backwards to his group of friends. They conferred for a moment. The woman reached into the passenger footwell and came out with a rucksack. Gobshite walked forward again, holding his hand out to the woman. She took the keys off him and flashed me a look. The man held his hand up to me, pulling the other one from his pocket. A pistol glinted in the Mercedes headlights. We will count the money now. I gave the woman a nod. She walked to the Porsche, throwing a rucksack in and climbing after it. It started with a hum shed the snow from its windscreen and pulled forward, almost silent, but for the crunching squeaking under its chunky Goodrich off-road tyres. The car was perfect for our purposes. She pulled past us, the red taillights disappearing down the access road with a whir. We agreed she'd blast it up the road, check the modifications had been made, before pulling into a lay-by we'd already scoped out. She'd use the tools in a rucksack to look over the electronics, the immobiliser, the tracker, check everything. Ten minutes was tight, but she was good. The gobshite motioned again at my car. I grabbed the bag and carried it round, placing it on the bonnet. He reached in greedily, thumbing wads of euro notes for a couple of minutes. It's 30 grand as agreed. He waved me away and carried on counting. I took my keys from my ignition, pocketed them, strolling to the side of the car park, out of the headlights so I could get a better look at the three men huddled by the Merc. I was paying well above the odds for a hot Porsche, but with the mods and the plates, the fact it was a range top in Turbo S, and of course, short notice tax. It was definitely worth it. Hey, shouted Gobshite. I looked back at the car. He grinned, gripping the bag of money tightly in his hammy fist. The price is another 10,000. It's 30 and that's too much. He shrugged. 30 is for the car. Another 10 for the test drive. Don't have any more, I said, walking back towards him, arms out in a placatory fashion. I had plenty of cash, but I wouldn't be giving any to this scumbag. He raised the pistol. Let's check what you have, too late. I'd close the distance, reaching up behind my back, under my hoodie, pulling out my own pistol. The length of the suppressor swung down, breaking his wrist as I continued to close the gap between us. He howled, dropping his own pistol into the snow. The three men by the Merc were too slow to react. By the time they had their own guns out, I had Gobshite's arms pinned, grinding the business end of my pistol into his flabby neck. He yelped. One of the men started walking forward, waving a gun stupidly, shouting French obscenities. The other two fanned out, sidestepping with their guns held firm. They weren't as dense. From the look of the stances, I guess they were ex-military, whereas the other guy was just a thug. Please, I'm just here to translate, the man in my arms whimpered. You understand, he is the... the... Je ne connais pas les mots. I drilled the barrel harder into his neck. Shut the fuck up. The other man was clearly visible in the lights of the Merc now. A big ugly head like a block of ice carved by that shit chainsaw sculptor from the village. He had a pistol in each hand, thinking he was in a John Woo film. He started to count down loudly. The two ex-army types had me perfectly flanked from each side of the car park, guns firmly on me. A hundred degrees angle between the three of them. Two spread out. <clears throat> two spread out. Plus, the two flanking guys had taken cover now. One behind a plywood Father Christmas sleigh and the other purring, peering round a happy elf workshop. He will kill you, he doesn't care about me, screamed Gobshite. The man stopped. His count reached one. Both pistols swung to point at me. I didn't have many options. His fingers were on the triggers, already squeezing, although two pistols meant the idiot wasn't really aiming either. I let go of Gobshite, dropped down behind him as the first gun fired. The second wasn't far behind. My own pistol just cracked once and the man dropped. Two more gunshots rang out either side of the car park and the other two men slumped in my peripheral vision. Silence in the falling snow. That the, f <clears throat> that the thug shots had missed was no real surprise, given his ridiculous gun discipline, but I was thankful they'd missed my car. I reached forward to pick up Gobshite's pistol and then strode through the snow to the thug's body, picking up his cheap Chinese Beretta copies from beside his ruined head. I turned to look at Gobshite, still whimpering on the ground, clutching his wrist. Get up, I said. He did, looking from one body to the other. Over on the right. 
on a small hill overlooking the car park, a snowdrift shuddered. It grew. The snow fell off to reveal a figure in Arctic camo gear, holding a Heckler & Koch HK-46 assault rifle. Another camo-clad figure walked out of the tree line on the left, holding my, my own HK, G-28 marksman. They swept in, picking up the weapons and then convened on the Mercedes. Snow crunched on the access road behind. The Porsche's headlights came around the corner. She slowed, pulling next to my Audi, winding the window down. You can't even do the simplest job, can you, Tyler? She said, without a trace of a smile. How's the car? I asked. She gave me a nod and wound the window back up, starting a three-point turn. The camo guys were crunching through the snow towards us, rifles slung over the shoulders. The first pulled his hood down and opened the Porsche's boot. It's a nice rifle, but I'll stick with the Ruger. He unslung my HK and patted it, putting it in the car. The other guy pulled up his ski mask and shook his head. Fucking amateurs. Always greedy. I picked up the bag of cash and took out one banded stack of 20s. I put it in gobshite, shaking good hand and waved at his dead mates. Get this shit cleaned up before Father Christmas comes back tomorrow. Thank you very much, Danny. And um, so that is Virtual Noir at the Bar 2020. Thank you to Hayley Webster, Danny Marshall, Trevor Wood, Ali Reynolds, Catherine Cooper, Andrew Cotto, Emma Christie, Nell Patterson, Derek Farrell, Githa Lodge, Greg Hewitt, and the winner of our Bay Tales short story competition, Louise Mangos. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening and for joining us throughout 2020. Do go on Twitter to vote for your quote of, quote of the week. And for those of you being very cheeky and saying I've, I've had more than one cocktail, I've just finished my second and they're very small. I'm just, I don't handle booze very well. Thank you to Billy Bragg and Jason Isaacs for the music. And massive, massive, massive thank you to Simon Buick for doing all the hard work behind the scenes. It's fair to say that Mr. B has been such a good boy that Santa should definitely have a sack full just for him. We will be back soon, so be sure to keep an eye um, on our Twitter pages, so at vnapb1, I think it is, and at baytails. Um, yes, so I think that's everything. Thank you again, everybody, for being with us. <laughs> I'm just reading the comments. You're all very naughty. And we will see you in 2021. Thank you. <laughs>